Okay, so I talked about it a couple weeks ago and I thought, well, in a blog post, and I thought I'd finally get around to doing it, which is let's talk about interviews and interview tactics and stuff like that because I think something important to talk about and, you know, obviously dealing with the troubles and the rejections of getting, going to interviews and stuff like that can be hard and, you know, obviously you want to have the best tactics and best kind of like ways of going about it so you can kind of not go through as much shit as you have to. So my fucking journey with interviews started out with when I first, or well, it was ju- I think just about to graduate from university. I think it might've been, oh God, it had to be sometime in 2018. And the first kind of proper interview I'd ever did for, you know, a proper office job was this place, a place called BSA or B, yeah, BSA or something that I think they did, it was like an analyst position. And I think they did something with like air cons and uh, bloody like fire hazard reduction stuff in, in buildings and stuff like that. And it was an analyst position. And I went in, did the interview, and it went shockingly bad. Like, it, it, it seemed good at first, but then some stuff happened, and it just kind of went really sour. And during the kind of later half of the interview, I knew deep down inside, the interviewer knew deep down inside, it wasn't going to, you know, work out. And so I kind of left that interview feeling pretty bad about myself, and that kind of sucked. But my dad then recommended or suggested that I go visit his friend, because my dad used to be a contractor, so he used to spend, you know, one or two years working for a place or a business or something, and then move on to the next. And this HR, like human re- human resource agent, like um, agency friend of my dad's, uh, you know, had worked with him for like 20 years or something, and, you know, placing him in different jobs. And my dad was like, oh, I'll set up a meeting f- with you to... Um, kind of talk with him about interviews and, and just the whole process and, and what to focus on and stuff like that. So I went to the kind of meeting with the guy. Oh God, I can't remember his, the worst part is I can't even remember his name now. God, that's, that's rough for him. But he's a good guy. He was a good guy. And what he kind of first got me, like sat me down. And at first I thought it kind of would be like a, like a technical kind of thing. Like he'd be talking about technical stuff like that. But eventually he just kind of was like, tell me about yourself. And God, isn't that like one of the most eight, like, you know, typical, uh, interview questions out there. It's like, tell just tell us about yourself. God damn. Um, and he wanted, and I went through that and kind of went through the motions with that question. He was like, oh, okay. But he was like, how more, how, like, how do you think you could more effectively answer that? Like, like your answer isn't bad, but how do you think you could make that better? And I was like, oh man, I don't know to talk more about my technical experience in uni. And he was like, oh, yeah, kind of. But the point he was trying to get to, and it was like the overarching principle that he wanted to kind of like um, show me or pass on to me was that you kind of have to make with these interview questions like, you know, tell us about yourself or when was there a time where you had a heated uh, customer relations moment and how did you manage it or you know when when has a manager provided you feedback and how did you respond to it when they're giving you these kinds of questions and stuff like that these like behavioral based questions what you want to do is answer them in a format called SEO or SEO which is stands for situation effect outcome oh god now I've now I've forgotten no S E S A O God Sal Sal God how did I forget that man this is all falling away from me really quickly um, God yeah I've got a, this, been in the job for about a year and a half now and now I've just completely forgotten interviewing God damn and I'm passing this video on okay so situation action outcome so the situation is well what, what as you can imagine the situation so if it's that customer, heated customer like relationship moment or the feedback from the manager, you kind of set the general context of the situation. It doesn't have to be so in such crazy detail where you know you can tell the temperature of the room, but just give out enough of a general uh, context that whoever is the interviewer can kind of follow the story along because that's what you're trying to uh, like you know affect is tell a good story because. Just a side note, a lot of these interviewers might not actually be your boss. They're just some person that, you know, is in HR at the company and is essentially just sussing you out, is just kind of getting a vibe for you. And with these kind of people, 
the way you want to lead them along or not lead them along but the way you want to convince them that hey you're right for, you know you're good for the job and you're not a complete psycho or something is that you want to be able to tell a good story and a good narrative that they can kind of follow so you lay out that situation and that gives them the general context and then you move on to your action and it has to be your action so it has to be framed from I did this or I did X, Y in this situation and then moving on to the last part which is outcome so you need to know and this takes time you might need to write it down in that kind of have a situation action outcome column like three columns like that and then write each one out for the you know kind of example that you want to use and kind of set up in that chain so lay out the basic context talk about then next focus on your actions what you did how you impacted things how you took the initiative or whatever and then lastly the outcome now the outcome might not necessarily be that you know the, that heated customer was like you know completely happy with you but even if you frame it like oh well you know i de like the outcome was that the customer was de-escalated like they were not as aggressive or you know you know rude or you know just you know awful as they were before they were a lot more understanding they may not be, have been super happy but at least they came down from that negative complete negative like spike which is you know the signs of you and your actions having a positive impact on the outcome now another thing i want to talk about in relation to interviews is when you're going f before you go to an interview like not just before but like you know in the days leading up to it i recommend going onto the main website of the business or whatever that you're applying to and look through the values because in every kind of corporate um well yeah in, in so many corporate co like company pages there'll be an about us page and usually under that there'll be a sub like page that's called our, like our values and stuff like that and these are really important to know you don't have to like read every single detail but you have to get a gist of it because what you want to be able to do is when they give you those behavioral based questions, you employ that SOW method, but you also look at what the values are that they apparently value and kind of work them into the mix of the story. And then that way that will like, cause you might have that same story, but depending on the values of the company, you might emphasize certain parts of it or you might, yeah, like you might emphasize certain outcomes or certain actions that you did that kind of align with those values because these HR people aren't that brilliant. So they kind of believe their own corporate, you know, company gospel of, oh, this is our company and this is what we represent and this is what we're all about. So if you can kind of sell that to them that, you know, through answering those questions with the, the sow and, you know, incorporating their values, they're going to be a much more inclined to invite you back, maybe for the second interview, which is usually the final one, unless it's one of those really competitive instances where, you know, you've got a bunch of people and you need three, four interviews. I mean, I've never personally been through anything like that, but I have been through a five person panel interview where it was me across the room from five really smart people. And I had to somehow sell myself and God, that is a whole story of pain that I had to do three years in a row and eventually it worked out, but let's not kind of focus on me too much. Um, moving forward, I think another reality, just in not just interviewing, but also in applying to jobs is a thing I see a lot and I've had friends on my LinkedIn, like, oh God, I can't believe going through LinkedIn, but friends on LinkedIn talking about like, oh man, it's so unfair that companies and job ads say, you have to have three to five years experience to apply for this job. And it's like, man, I just kind of look at that and laugh and I'm just like, dang, you really think that? Man, you're an idiot. I mean, well, I don't think they're an idiot because I actually think that I actually know them and they're not a bad person, but I think they're misguided in their apprehension to that because the reality is this, if you've been working in a job for three to five years or, or maybe it's, you know, whatever arbitrary number, two to three years, you know, two to five years or whatever experience in a job, whatever it be, at that point, at the end of that tenure of you working in that experience at that level, you should be ideally looking to move up to the next level. So 
let's say you spend, uh, let's just use like a, an example I'd be used to. So let's say you've been a data analyst for, I don't know, three to five years. You shouldn't be looking for a data analyst job. You should be looking for a data manager, like the, the next layer up. You, you shouldn't be applying to that kind of job. Like you, you have, you've mastered, well, in theory, it should have mastered that level of competency so why are you just sitting in that same like talent pool? You should be trying to move up. You should be moving up. And I think that's where you have instances where people spend like, you know, 20 years in the same job title and in the same kind of sphere without ever moving up. I'm like, no, you, you, you at a certain point, yeah, you might learn a few things more, but you should be ideal. You're going to learn a lot more and get better as a, like you'd be a far more competent person the higher you get up because you'll have more responsibility and more ability to change things. And, you know, all of your experience in the past will tell you, you know, where things have gone wrong and where if you're in a management position, you can make those changes. So to that whole app, like, so if you, if you see a job ad that says, you know, must have three to five years experience, still apply. Like what's the worst that they can say to you? No, it's like, okay, well, sweet. I'll just move on to the next job. And, and that's the kind of mentality you kind of have to have. Like if you get rejected and I've talked about this in a blog post about rejection is if you apply for a job and get rejected, you need to get excited about that because you actually tried. Whereas, you know, most people that see the ad, let's just make a pull out a random number. Let's say like 60% of people that see that job ad, they see to that, they see that three to five years experience and then immediately don't apply. So just from that alone, you've already cut out 60% of the competition and then, you know, you were going through the application, you even starting the application and going through it, you know, probably another 10% get halfway, you know, get halfway through the application process and then go, oh man, I'm probably not cut out for this. Oh man, this is all too hard or I'd rather just watch TV or something. And so you, you're cutting off more people there. So it's just, it just gets easier and easier. So the more you apply, the more chances you have because it's that old thing. If you never try, you never succeed. So definitely do that. And another thing, and this is just a general office culture thing or like, you know, and this is kind of somewhat confined to working in an office, but I'm sure you can do it in some other places. I don't know exactly because I've only ever worked in an office is where, um, if you're a guy wear a suit and if you're a woman wear like a really, I don't know, a professional looking business outfit because the reason why I think that's really smart and a really good way to go about it is I do kind of believe somewhat in that, um, you know, dress for the job you want kind of mentality because, you know, shit, man, I, I've, I've worn a suit in pretty at much every co corporate, well, like every office job I've ever had, right? And I mean, in the space of three years, I moved up pretty quickly I mean, surprisingly quickly, like it's, it's kind of weird how like uniforms and like you can look at that, like a suit or professional business attire as a kind of uniform. It's weird how it informs other people's, um, you know, assumptions about you. And you might think, oh, well, they might assume you're an asshole or a corporate douchebag or something like that. But I mean, you can break that with just being a nice person. That's one way you could do it. But they kind of, it's almost like they relay a certain amount of prestige with you by even just wearing it. I don't know if it's just because it's the effort you go to put on, oh, it's not much of an effort, God. Everyone else wears slack pants and a, a buttoned up shirt. The only extra effort is putting on the coat jacket, like the suit jacket. So it's not that much of a bigger effort. So, I mean, maybe not, maybe that's not right. But there is a certain like, I don't know if it's just also like people look good in suits, like guys tend to just, every guy I know, like it doesn't matter if they're the biggest stoner, if they wear a suit, they look 10 times better. Like, I just don't know why it has the, one of those effects where it just, it makes people look more attractive. And, and maybe that's like that whole thing of attractive people go further in life. I, I don't know the causality of it, but all I do know is it does kind of work. And another great part about it is if you're going to be applying for jobs, especially if you're moving from one job to the next, you're going to need to wear a suit. And the reason why I recommending, like recommend wearing a suit every workday is because if you're wearing a suit, if you go to a job interview, no one's going to know that you went to a job interview because you're always wearing a suit. 
Meanwhile, if you don't wear a suit and then all of a sudden one day you rock up wearing a suit, people are going to be like, what's going on there? And that might all be all good and well if you get the job straight out, but likely, but you know, the more likely situation is it's going to take a couple, you know, a couple goes and it might even take months or maybe even worst case, a couple of years to find the right place, like to find a good enough place to move on to. Um, hopefully it doesn't take that long, but you know, it could happen. And if people see that you, you know, sometimes coming in with a suit, they might get kind of, there's always that kind of like divide when someone's going to either about to leave or is think, or is like planning to leave. Like it kind of like people start already preparing that whole thing of you're going to be gone at one point. And so things get harder within the, that business ecosystem that you're in. So that's why I think if you stay in the suit, like every single time or professional business attire all the time, people won't notice when you go into these interviews. So they'll just kind of assume that you took a long lunch or something, you know, something like that, but they won't assume the worst that you're going to leave. So I think that is something to think about. And I know some people might say, well, that's easy for you to say, cause you're a guy and for guys wearing a suit's easy, but for women it's hard because we constantly have to change our outfits otherwise. And then they always kind of don't really Anytime I've had a conversation with someone else like that uh, with, about that, who's going down that that rabbit hole about like, oh, but women have to wear, always have to wear different outfits or regularly have to change their outfits. You know, they can't just wear the same thing. Yeah, you know, they can't wear the same outfit. You know, twice a week. I always kind of challenge that, and I'm like, says who? Like, who who says you can't? Like, you know, is there any? Is there a company policy against it? I didn't think so, and when we go down to the logical like kind of end point of that argument uh, and their argument, it just comes down to they have this irrational fear that if they wear the same thing twice in a week or if they wear the same outfit, maybe like, I don't know, once a fortnight or whatever, uh, let's just go stick with once a week or oh, sorry, more than once a week, then people are going to judge them and people are going to talk about them. And that is just so not true because, well, if it is true and if some if people do talk like that like in your office i mean damn at that point why the hell do you care what those people think cuz that has to be if someone is honestly going wow i can't believe alice is wearing that same top again this week oh god it's it's like are you kidding me that is the most mean girls thing like esque thing you could say ever and or even think and you know at that point why care what someone like that thinks like they are just a horrible psychopath like you don't need to worry about what they think like that is just unneeded stress for you so just you miss that shit straight away just like don't even at me with that and then the second part is if those you know besides those mean girl-esque people which i think probably don't really even exist i think they're just a hypothetical um but everyone else like every normal person in your office which is going to be the majority of people the reality is they are not paying attention to you. It's like, it's that old thing. I don't know if it was Shakespeare or whoever said it, but it's just like, you're an extra in everybody else's play, like their life. Like you're an extra in everybody else's life. You know what I mean? You aren't the main character. Stop thinking that people are constantly got you on their mind. Like, no, it's not happening. And, and even if they do, like, even if the thought does come into someone's head for a moment, They'll then just go, oh, okay, I need a coffee or something. Like some other thought will come and just, you know, negate the other one. And then their focus of attention is on that or, oh, I've got to do this. Or, you know, got to pick up the kids or some crap like that. So it just all fades away. So male or female, I think, yep, wear professional looking business attire and in your, um, in your job, in your office job, because it will, I think it will pay off because it has definitely paid off for me in the long run. And yeah, I think it will too for you. And like, it's something that like, it's one of those compounding things that you got to stick to. And the longer you do it, the, the kind of more the people just associate you with it. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. And they don't like, it's no longer, cause man, when I, my, in my first job that I ever landed, I was the only person besides like the head of client relations who wore a suit to work. Like it was just me and that guy. And even then that guy, if he wasn't having to meet a client for a meeting, he'd actually take it off. So I was really the only person wearing a suit. And 
that kind of also became almost like my thing, like my niche that people like, oh, even if they didn't know my name, they'd be like, oh yeah, he's the guy with the suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it's such a, it's such a, di- and maybe in different business cultures in different countries, it's different. But at least in Australia, like, man, no one wears suits. So it's like, if you're the one person that does or one of the few people that does, you stand out. You are immediately someone, and like in a good way, like not in that, like they're an outsider kind of way. It's just kind of like, you're doing something different and you own it. And people kind of, oddly enough, respect that. And so that's why I think, yeah, I definitely recommend that for, you know, just kind of how going about navigating the kind of corporate or just, you know, working world in general. Um, can't, I might do another, I I have some more thoughts and I want to expand on this, um, in a later video because there, I've got to go through my memories just of like the crazy 11 month period of me going for like two to three interviews a week. There's a lot more like, uh, little bits of information and little tips that I can give you. But I think this is enough for this video. And we might, I'm not, I'm not saying the next video will be an interview one, but later down the line, I'll do some more and, you know, pass on any tips or if anything comes to mind later in the coming, you know, in in the future, I'll definitely try and pass it on to you guys. But, you know, thanks for listening. And, you know, if you'd liked and subscribed or commented, that'd mean a lot to me. And thanks so much.